Hello, I'm Noel Lim on ASEAN Speaks by Maybank. As the US enters a technical recession but with strong jobs data, how will this affect the Fed's decision on interest rates in September? And in a slower growth environment, how resilient are banks and REITs in Singapore and Malaysia? Portfolio strategist Ong Seng Yao discusses with the analysts. Welcome everybody and a good morning uh, to everybody who's t- tuning into the show. We left last week on a high note with the Dow, Nasdaq and S&P turning in weekly gains of anywhere between 3 to 4.5%. But if we look at the corporate earnings the results, it was really a mixed bag. So was this a reflection of the Fed's uh, preparedness for a policy pivot, or is this just a bear market rally? Today, our panelists will basically take us through some of these uh, key issues. And also in this week, where we have the uh, non-farm payrolls uh, uh, data. So it's going to be a very big uh, week uh, for us. Uh, in addition to that, we will also be taking views on uh, GE15. Uh, we will also be talking about ASEAN banks and uh, Singapore REITs. So without further ado, let me walk over to uh, Hakbin's desk right now to uh, ask him a little bit about the macroeconomic uh, outlook. Hakbin, good morning to you. Um, if we look at the, uh, uh, you know, on the Fed side of things, right, the FOMC raised the target range uh, for the Fed funds rate by 75 basis points to 2.25 to 2.5 percent last week, uh, but real GDP, you know, if we look look at that. It fell about one one percent in Q2. It's contracting for the second straight quarter, and pushing the U.S. economy into the technical recession. Can you help us anticipate the outcome of the September FOMC meeting? What observations can we make by studying the Fed's past responses to pausing interest rate hikes? Is it just ISM housing sales? employment credit spreads what, what what would be the one or two metrics that you would be focusing on Hakbin? hey i'm morning sing young so i think we think the fed is still far more concerned about inflation than growth despite the u.s economy slipping into a technical recession in the second quarter um and it is technical as Jeanette yellen highlighted uh, ultimately the nbr national bureau of economics research is the arbiter for recessions and i think it's hard to imagine that this will be an official recession when the job market remains you know, so strong. We call that the uh, non-farm payroll numbers in June was up 372,000. Uh, so that's pretty strong. Actually, on Friday, they also released the consumer spending in June, which uh, accelerated 1.1%. So I don't think they're too uh, you know, preoccupied about the, about the technical uh, recession part. Um, and actually, on Friday, there was some releases on the inflation kind of figures, which still... Uh, I think kind of suggests worrying trends. Uh, the core PCE, for example, um, you know, indicated the Fed likes to gauge actually jump 0.6% in June. That's up 0. Point, up from the 0.3% in May. And uh, and a closely track, of course, is the employment cost index, because that gives a sense on the wage cost pressure. That still rose 1.3% in the second quarter, um, just slowing slightly from the 1.4% in the first quarter. Uh, so labor costs are still uh, you know, an, an issue. So you know, I think markets may have been uh, kind of on the optimistic side to read that the Fed um, you know, might slow the pace of increase. And, uh, and Powell, I guess, suggested that, you know, the, that they will assess how cumulative policy adjustments are affecting the economy and situation. So ultimately, it really depends how fast inflation falls off. The, the non-farm payroll number will be a key one to watch this week. But I think because inflation is just so high, at over nine percent, I think you know we have to go back to the early nineteen eighties to really gauge uh, the Fed response. And really, uh, because it's just so high, I think the risk is still for the Fed to keep going. Um, the Fed future market might be too optimistic to start pricing in a rate cut in early next year. Uh, we think inflation will come down simply because food and commodity prices all are all coming down. But remember that the wage cost is a very large component. Uh, of the services inflation in the US. So ultimately, we think that the fight will hike by 50 basis points in September, followed by 25, 25, November, December. But actually, given the some of the figures that came out on Friday, I'm not sure we can completely rule out another 75 basis point hike. Okay. How can, you know, between this 75 basis point and 50 basis point scenario, and uh, looking at this Friday's uh, non-farm payrolls, Consensus right now is at 250K. That number comes in anywhere close to that. 
do you think it will basically swing the Fed towards a more a uh, 50 basis point scenario more than the other? I mean, if it's really far below 2250K, and they might consider, but remember, it's still plus 250K, you know, the economy is still generating jobs, you know, which is very hard to square with a recession where jobs are lost, you know. So I think if it comes in negative, you know, I think that's more consistent recession that actually maybe you know, force the Fed to pause or hike by a much lower pace. Okay. And one last question, Hagrid. You know, when we speak with our clients, um, there's always some reference back to the last uh, uh, pause cycle, which is, you know, 2018, 2019. Uh, minus the inflation side, because we didn't get that, that uh, 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 factor. Uh, if we look at all of these growth slowdown because of the Trump tariffs and uh, uh, trade war and all that, were there other factors that, there that were similar to this cycle that we could maybe take take uh, some lessons from? Well, it's pretty different, you know, because I think that as you highlighted, I mean, the key one is inflation, right? You know, inflation uh, hardly picked up, and then before the Fed started uh, tightening, and because inflation was an issue and came down quite quickly, the Fed was able to cut it very aggressively you know, to deal with the downturn. It's just that this time, um, even the economy slows and slips into a recession, I suspect the Fed doesn't have that, uh, that room, you know. So the, the Fed doesn't have that uh, put option to save the markets. Okay. All right. Thank you, Harvard. Uh, Winston, let me take this next question to you. Um, so if we look at the fixed income markets, you wrote that late cycle dynamics hasn't really played out in full and there's room for the U.S. Treasury yields to fall further over the next six months. So it's now a pretty good time for sales desk to be pushing bonds if yields in general are kind of expected to come off. Hi, morning, Sing Yao. Hey. Um, yeah, you have dropped quite substantially, I would say. Um, from a tactical point of view, it probably is not a very good time to pile in now. But from a structural point of view, I do believe that the impact of late cycle dynamics on bond yield, we have not seen the full impact yet. Actually, we have been bullish on U.S. treasuries over the past two to three months, uh, pushing very hard that investors should buy during the sell-off when yields were very attractive. Um, currently, the 10-year yield has fallen to 2.65. We forecast 2.5% for, uh, uh, for the 10-year yield by the end of 2022. So I would say it's, it's, it hasn't played out in full, but uh, roughly 80% done. And looking ahead from here, if one has a very strong holding power, no stop loss trigger, and let's take a medium term view, six to 12 months. Yes, I think there's still money to be made from long treasury positions. Um, but, but for short term trading positions, we probably need to watch out for some technical, given how much um, the market has rallied. And as we know, it can be a very volatile environment. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for that view. Um, Winston, as a follow-up question, um, you know, the MAS surprised the market on July 14 uh, to tighten its FX policy in a pretty much off-cycle move. Uh, this was then quickly followed by the uh, Philippine Central Bank with a 75 basis point hike, uh, which was similarly also an off-cycle move uh, ahead of its August policy decision. This obviously will put pressure on other central banks uh, in ASEAN. What's the implication here on the Malaysia's credit market and your outlook for Malaysia bonds? Yeah, the central bank settings look quite hawkish in July. Big hikes and a bit of off-cycle move here and there. But ASEAN government bond markets actually rallied in July because uh, if you look at the implied pricings um, in the curve, in the yield curve, um, a lot has actually been priced in. And even after the rate hike, the surprise move, if you look at uh, Philippines, Thailand, and Malaysia, the market has still priced in for an additional 75 to 150 bips hike over the, in total over the next uh, 12 months. So from Malaysia, we think BNM can afford to remain steady without having to rush for a bigger hike like 50 bip. There are two MPC meetings left in 2022. If BNM hike by 25 bip each, it will still bring the OPR to 2.75%, which is just a short distance away from 3%, which we think is the neutral rate for Malaysia. So MGS durations have rallied significantly uh, over the past one month. 
I think the current MGS yields look fair, although it's not particularly compelling as before. We maintain our forecast that ringgit government bonds will see a positive return of about 1% uh, to 3% in 2022. Okay. Aside from MGS, how about on the corporate bond side? Any observations there that you could share with the audience? Usually, the credit market in Malaysia lacks MGS. If the rally stay, if the MGS curve stay where it is, um, we do expect credits to play catch up eventually. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, I want to bring in Julia here uh, on a uh, on the Thai market. Uh, uh, I hope she's on the line. Um, Julia, do you expect any surprises when Thailand uh, uh, is broadly expected to go for its rate, first rate hike uh, on 10th of August? Hi, morning, Seng Yao. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think it's a given that uh, the BOT is going to hike in the upcoming meeting on the 10th of August. Uh, the BOT governor has kind of already uh, stated that uh, the rate hike should not come too late uh, and that the economy has kind of, is recovering uh, quite firmly. They are looking at 2Q GDP growth to come in at 3% uh, on the back of a strong rebound in private consumption, uh, which they are looking at at around 9.9%, uh, accelerating from the 2.9% in the first quarter. Um, he did uh, add that uh, the policy rate hike um, We've been conducted gradually, uh, so balancing with economic growth, uh, price stability, as well as financial system stability. Uh, so we are actually keeping uh, our forecast for three uh, rate hikes in the second half of the year. So they are in each meeting in August, uh, September, as well as November. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, let me bring in uh, Sakti Andy on the uh, FX uh, market. Uh, Andy. The Sing dollar has outperformed regional currencies uh, post the off-cycle tightening. Um, what's your take on the Sing dollar and the ringgit? Um, uh, morning, Sing Yao. Um, yes, so uh, our view is, I think, in terms of the Sing ringgit, it has definitely te- reached uh, a peak of about uh, 3 to 4 about a few weeks ago, and within this month, it reached a high about three three twenty two and slightly above to 3 to 4. Our sense is, I think, uh, as possibility because of the one of the main drivers is possibility because of the Sing dollar MSS uh, recentering, uh, which uh, sort of uh, accelerated the Sing dollar strength. In fact, on the trade rated basis, the Sing near is currently about one to one point five percent, still above the midpoint. Now currently about one percent or so, uh, which suggests there's still some element of strength. Um, our view is from the Sing Ringgit bilateral perspective is we think um, Sing Ringgit should be in a tight range of still between this 320 to 325 range. Um, and one of the predict- reasons why it could still reach to the upper end of that band or range is because of the Ringgit. Um, uh, we have actually slightly revised our Ringgit forecast uh, in the last monthly on the back of uh, revisions uh, to factor in some sensitivities that the ringgit has to external risk triggers, such as exposures to uh, China because of the significant China trade linkages, and of course, the oil outlook because of the slightly softening in oil. So we're trying to factor that in and revise ringgit slightly weaker towards the end of the year. On that basis, if you take into consideration uh, the Sing dollar strength and the possibility not ruling out a possibility of a potential slightly additional tightening in October MAS moves, uh, although the our house in-house view is not expecting a move at the moment. Uh, but to some extent, um, that should actually allow that uh, the Sing Ringgit to still be uh, at risk of reaching the upper end of that 320 to 325 range. So our forecast for the end of year is still about 324 uh, before easing off next year, by end of next year, uh, towards the three. 16 to 320 range. Uh, okay, yeah. thanks, Andy. Andy, you brought in a point earlier about the uh, Chinese economy and uh, uh, possibility that, that if things stay weak, uh, I think your inference here is that uh, it could obviously have a bearing in terms of the uh, FX performance for the region. What's your take given the recent set of um, uh, manufacturing data coming out of China? Uh, I think we all know that it's not exactly that that strong with all the lockdowns. Uh, but where might be the tipping point B um, so that uh, some of our FX traders could watch out for that scenario? 
I think, yes. So uh, we're still looking out in terms of the China scenario. If uh, manufacturing numbers uh, starts coming out weaker um, and uh, synchronized global slowdown sort of concerns starts picking up again, uh, on that basis, I think the dollar resolve, uh, the resolve sort of environment picks up and I think the dollar strength might come back in again. So as we have highlighted in our pieces before, uh, we think over the next few months and the current China data or manufacturing is not a new reflection of the concerns. Um, uh, so if that sort of exacerbates, uh, we think the dollar support would come back in again, uh, despite some of the easing off from the dollar strength that we've seen over the past uh, week or a few days as well. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks, Andy. Uh, Han Jun, let me come to you right now uh, on the funds flow. Uh, as we know, funds flow has been particularly harsh on Malaysia. Pre-COVID, the Malaysia stock market's average uh, daily traded value was between two to three billion. This went up to five to six billion during COVID. And based on current numbers, uh, ADT has now dropped to, I think, about one billion. Uh, in your latest report, you are taking uh, the view uh, that Malaysia's equity market may have found a bottom. What evidence supports your, your outlook? Morning, Senya. If, hey. if we look at in terms of valuations of the Malaysian market, MSCI Malaysia is currently trading at about 13.6 times forward PE, slightly above its um, five-year historical low of 13.3 times. Many sectors are also trading close to their five-year historical lows. And valuations of uh, the Malaysian market has been quite has been uh, quite depressed because of a couple of reasons: um, political uncertainty, and then you have um, negative earnings impact from Chukai Makmo, which mainly impacted the big cap stocks, and you have um, global inflation worries, um, where mostly the growth stocks were negatively impacted. So if we look at these negative factors, we think that it could actually um, soon. Uh, it could fade or even it could turn into positive catalyst. So take, for example, look, if you look at political uncertainty, um, because ge general election will have to be held by next year, September. And if there's an early election, it could be a re-rating catalyst for the local equity markets. And second, in terms of um, earnings, um, MSCI Malaysia's EPS is expected to grow by 11.6% next year. And in terms of um, inflation worries, if you look at the uh, US market expectation for inflation, it has fallen quite substantially from the levels uh, three to four months ago. And this could provide relief for the global equity markets. Interesting point about uh, uh, the election side of things. Um, following BN's win in uh, Johor and Malacca, the key faction led by Omna, which is also BN's largest constituent party, has been pushing for an early election. What is the ideal window for the Prime Minister to dissolve Parliament? Should he opt to carry an early election this year? The, the ideal window to dissolve the Parliament will be somewhere in between 1st of August till late of September, so that an early election could be held by um, somewhere around mid-September till late of November. Um, right before the monsoon season starts in December. Okay. And uh, in that scenario, based on past uh, election cycles, uh, in the months leading up to the election, what, what observations can we take away from those uh, cycles? And what are your top sector picks? Yeah, if we look back into the past three recent general election, in the three months period leading up to each of the general election, um, Performance has been different for different sectors. Of course, in GE14, we have the consumer staples with, which rallied uh, basically due to a uh, cash handout from the previous government. And then you have GE13, which was mainly led by property stocks and construction stocks. And GE12 is uh, a little different because of the global financial crisis. So only one of the sector managed to register positive returns. But if you look at the average performance um, leading up to the period, then you will see that um, financials, consumer staples, and healthcare, they have generated on average the highest return. And we like these sectors because consumer staples can be a potential beneficiary of cash handouts, while uh, financials and healthcare, they tend to also provide more resilient returns uh, regardless of the expected election outcome. Okay. 
Thank you, Hanjin, for those uh, views. Uh, let's uh, swing over to the, uh, the banking sector right now. And I'd like to invite Dylan on to the, uh, uh, into our room. Um, Dylan, you recently just downgraded the banks uh, because of the looming threat of, of a uh, recession. Uh, among all the uh, countries that you provide coverage on, why do you think Malaysia, Singapore, and Indonesia will likely perform better than the region? Dylan? Yeah, morning, Sang Yao. Yeah, I mean, banks are cyclical, so and a recession can, you know, tip them into a down cycle. Um, we think you need to be very, very selective uh, of what banks you own during such a cycle. Um, and as you say, our analysis shows that Singapore, Malaysia, and Indonesia um, uh, have offered the sort of best shelter. Um, what we do is we look at history. And when we analyzed about 16 years of data here, and we see that the banks that have the best track records of delivering uh, the least volatility in terms of earnings uh, and have the most consistency in dividends and also have the strongest balance sheets tend to outperform. Um, now, if you look at the region, the least volatile net, net interest income generators are the Malaysian banks. Well, uh, for non-interest income, it's actually the Malaysian banks and the Singapore banks. Uh, the banks that deliver the most consistent and strongest dividend growth tend to be the Singapore banks, Malaysian banks, as well as the Indonesian banks. So that's how we've kind of come up to this conclusion that the Sing Singapore, Malaysian, and Indonesian banks um, are, are sort of best places to hide during this part of the cycle. Okay, thanks. Let me uh, ask Desmond to come on for a view on the Malaysian banking sector as well. Desmond, um, uh, I think uh, uh, a large part of the banks uh, have already reported their results, especially CIMB. Uh, what, uh, what's your take on the sector and also your top picks uh, there? Right. Uh, thanks, Sing Yong. So essentially, I do agree with Tillon that the banks in Malaysia will be particularly resilient, particularly since um, within the banks itself, the average net dividend yield for this year is about 4.2% and about 4.8% into 2023. So the dividend yields should provide some support to overall share prices, actually. The buys that we have are on Hong Kong Bank, RHB, um, our AMMB, Hong Kong Financial Group, and Alliance Bank at this point in time. Okay, thank you. Let's now jump over to the Singapore REIT sector. Um, Sutai. Uh, where are SREIT yield spreads now relative to the historical spreads uh, against the 10-year bond yield? Morning, Seng Yao. Hi. So, uh, well, Singapore REITs uh, now yielding actually in terms of actual yield, uh, undemanding 5.6%. Now, this is lower than the historical average yield of 6.2%, but less than minus one standard deviation away from the mean. If you consider the yield spread, which is your question to the 10-year government bond yield, uh, and because this has been climbing in the last 18 months, it's caused the yield spread to narrow. The spread is now 2.8%. That's close to minus one standard deviation below, below the historical average. Okay, thanks. Well, it's it's still looking good relative uh, to, I think the other day, our Philippines REITs analyst did share that, uh, uh, you know, many of the yields uh, were basically below the benchmark rate. There's a very difficult case to actually sell uh, on that sector. Um, so it's good to hear that Sing REITs are still kind of uh, exhibiting these positive uh, uh, spread trends. Um, so against this uh, scenario then, uh, do you think going forward, and we talked a little bit about the prospect, the specter of a recession. I mean, the, the possibility of a re recession uh, later this year, so forth, right? Um, do you think that REITs can still drive growth or will share prices have to kind of drop for the spreads to actually go back to, to uh, normal trends? So I think the market could focus on the macro headwinds uh, from rising interest rates, but we still see growth in terms of deep use uh, for the sector. And this will come mainly from recovering rents. So we've seen that already come true in the June quarter uh, for industrial REITs. Uh, we think rents have bottomed out uh, and are strengthening, especially for logistics space. Grade A office rents are up 4.6% in the first half of the year versus our earlier forecast uh, of 7% for the full year and are expected to firm up uh, from demand growth and importantly from tight supply. So we saw last Friday the hospitality REITs reported firmer breath power recovery in the second quarter with momentum to be sustained into the second half. So they're expected to deliver 
8 to 30% DPU growth over the next two years, I think risk definitely on the upside. So balance sheets across the sector are strong. Uh, REITs are cautious in terms of underwriting deals. Cap rates have so far been stable. It will support capital recycling efforts, uh, in my view. I think the REITs are looking to add should cap rates expand for selected assets against the higher interest rate environment. This would add to the DPO growth forecast as well. So we, are, we go bottom up. Uh, we are selective. Our strategy has been to stick with the large cap proxies that can promise the 5 to 6% dividend yield and then the stronger than peer DPU growth profile driven by better occupancy, stronger rents and then acquisition upside. Is the hospitality sector your favourite sector at the moment? Uh, it uh, ranks behind uh, industrial and then office, mainly because hospitality is uh, a smaller sector relative to the rest. We want to be in the more liquid sectors of industrial um, and then also on the office where we're seeing also stronger rentals. Okay, then on the office side, perhaps taking a hybrid office and retail, can you talk us through your latest views on uh, Capital Land Integrated Commercial as well as SunTech, please? Thanks, Yao. So uh, we like uh, CICT. Uh, it's the largest uh, Singapore REIT and the proxy to the commercial sector. For the first half of this year, the numbers that came out last week, we saw stable retail occupancy and better rental reversion. That was driven by stronger recovery of the downtown malls uh, that they have in their portfolio. Uh, retail sentiment overall actually is improving and occupancy costs manageable. Um, and we see rooms for rents to strengthen in the second half. For them, the office fundamentals were even better due to successful backfilling of vacancies at a few of their Singapore Grade A properties. Committed occupancy uh, is higher, that's at 87 to 100% versus actual occupancies, which is right now 67 to 84%. What this means is that we should be looking for a stronger NPI contribution in the second half. So with limited earnings impact from rising interest rates and also inflation cost pressures, this will mean that earnings visibility is there and is rising for both retail and office for them. This stands as one of our top picks for the sector. We like that it has both DPU growth and also on the valuation side, not demanding at 5.2% yield this year, it rises to 5.5% next year. And lastly, potential near-term acquisition growth upside. On Suntech REIT, it remains a key beneficiary of Singapore's reopening. Uh, Suntech City Mall's performance improved further in the second quarter, driven by higher occupancy, new tenants, better rental reversion, and then a turnaround for the convention business. We expect this momentum to be carried into the second half and then stronger growth uh, in FY23. Uh, office occupancy is high, 98%. That's very strong, uh, with demand coming in from tech and financial institutions. Together with the low supply, it should enable better pricing in terms of rents. For them, reversion was positive 5.7% in Singapore. And don't forget, they have assets in Australia that was at an even stronger 10 to 35%. Gearing is high though, uh, 43%, and this could prompt capital recycling. So potential divestments uh, to lower their leverage. But what we see is also favorable risk reward at 6% yield, and then also visibility on capital distributions uh, still a buy for us. Thanks, Ingeo. Just maybe got a minute left. Let me also ask you a question on the industrial REITs also. This probably looks like the ugly duckling within the uh, crowd. Can you talk us through about the maple tree industrial, please? Okay, so industrial REITs as a whole, we are seeing REMs uh, bottoming out uh, in Singapore. Uh, I mean, if you look at maple tree industrial uh, performance for this particular quarter, it's clear to us. Um, we like overall the fact that there is still the acquisition pipeline for the sponsor itself, although I think it really will depend on when the sponsor is ready to sell. Overall, we think the fundamentals are actually strong. It's improved significantly because right now you have 51% of the uh, AUM driven by uh, data center uh, properties where the fundamentals in terms of demand growth is actually very, very bright. Um, we like overall the valuations right now that it's probably at 5.5%, uh, sorry, 5% DPU growth relative to pure data center REITs that are trading at around uh, 4 to 4.5%. Um, 
overall, uh, this remains a buy for us. Okay. Thanks, Yang. Great. Thank you very much. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Thank panelists and you for also joining us this morning. Please feel free to reach out to any one of us if you have any questions on the topics raised today. Happy hunting. Thank you again. Get specific advice from your trading rep and download our research reports at Market Insights on the Maybank Trade app. Go well and have a good investing week. I'm Noel Lim on Asian Speaks by Maybank.